All right, let's talk a little bit about Jean Piaget. Jean Piaget was a Swiss theorist who was gifted at working with children. He um, just seemed to have a knack for um, knowing how to conduct research that really got to how children are thinking. Now, Piaget specialized in something called cognitive development. In fact, he created a theory called the constructivist theory of cognitive development. The um, constructivist theory of cognitive development is a stage theory. A stage theory is a theory that is we, we go through certain developmental changes at certain ages. And these, these are stages of the way that we think, where we have a wholesale shift in the way we think. And so his stages um, were, were really, really kind of interesting. And in fact, they're pretty easy to remember. Um, and if you can just say South Plains College is fun, say it out loud. South Plains College is fun. Then you can remember Piaget's stages because those are actually the acronyms that the sensory motor, pre-operational, um, um, concrete operations, um, and then formal operations. And so if you can remember South Plains College is fun, SPCF, then you can um, remember all of the names of his stages. He studied those specific stages and the shifts in the way that children think. And so in any lifespan um, course, we're going to talk a lot about Piaget because he was the single biggest, biggest name in cognitive development for children. And so let me tell you a little bit about his theory and kind of the way that he studied it. Well, first of all, he did a lot of his research right there with his own children, and he just had a knack for it. In fact, one of his um, research studies was right there in his own own um, kitchen. He took some bacon, and he um, put a slice of bacon on one of his children's plates. And this was actually during breakfast, by the way. And the other child, he he um, put the bacon on his plate, and when he did, it broke in half. And when it broke in half, the child who just had one slice began to cry and say, Daddy, Daddy, they got more than me. And Piaget tried to show him no, and he put the bacon back together over and over and tried to show him no, they got just as much as you did. And um, the um, kid that got the one part, just, just one piece, would not um, let go of it. Piaget tried to explain, no, it's the same amount of bacon. It's the same mass. Look at it. Instead, finally, Piaget just grabbed the bacon, turned it around, broke it in half, put it on his plate, and the child said, oh, thank you, Daddy. <laughs> Wiped all their tears away. Piaget realized what most of you with children realize, kids think differently than adults. And so let's go through each of his stages. I mean, the first stage is the sensory motor period. The sensory motor period um, is where a child primarily is about, well, I mean, the name is pretty self-explanatory, figuring out their senses and how to coordinate their motor movements with those senses. Like, so for instance, um, they reach out and see an apple, they, or a chunk of apple, they'd be able to reach out and grab it and then experience it. So their motor skills of grabbing the apple, seeing it with their eyes, and tasting it. That's all their sensory motor. So it tells you most of what they're doing. Now let me tell you what a, a kid, especially eight months old and under, what their favorite game is. And this is cross-cultural, by the way. You'll, you'll know it when you see it. Peekaboo! Now, if that was awkward for you, just know it was a little awkward for me. I'm a grown man playing peekaboo. Now, if you were eight months old, though, that would be like going to a Chris Angel show. Man, I'd be blowing your mind because they're developing um, this thing called object permanence, and they don't develop object permanence until they're about eight months old, okay? So when you've got your hands in front of your face, it's like it doesn't exist, so all of a sudden, when the hands come up, come away from the face, it's like Chris Angel blowing their mind. It's there. There's the face. Woo! A lot of their things, like a jack-in-the-box. I mean, you know it's coming. But for a baby, man, they'll do that over and over and over again. It's, it's the funniest thing, isn't it? And so um, that object permanence is something they get around eight months or so. And um, that's kind of the stages from zero to one is that, that sensory motor stage, right? Um, and then they go through a stage, uh, or zero to two. Some zero to two is really what the sensory motor stage is. Then they go through a stage of two to six, okay? Two to six is what we call the pre-operational um, stage. The pre-operational stage, yes, they're beginning to understand. They have memory and they've got um, concrete operation. Uh, they've got, they've got um, the ability to 
to remember where something was like object permanence, but they're not able to do problem solving. Okay. So a lot of their problem solving is, is really funny. Like you can take, um, two cans of Play-Doh of the exact same mass and you can roll one into a, um, into a snake and you can take the other one, a real long snake, and you can make this wonderful intricate, intricate little tiger out of it. And then you can ask them which one's bigger and they're liable to say the snake due to something called centration, okay? Centration is where they kind of center on one aspect of the problem. You rolled it out, it looks longer. Well, length must be the answer. Um, it's gotta be the snake. They also lack something called reversal. So the two to six year old isn't able to take that Play-Doh and put it back in the can. You see, as adults, when you start any kind of problem, you automatically start it with reversal, okay? So what you do, is you already you automatically put the play-doh back in the can. It's just like when you lose your keys. What do you do? You retrace your steps. You ask a kid from two to six, where are your shoes? And it's the funniest thing. They'll go to all the rooms that they have not been. Or they won't even move. My kids don't even move. I say, where are your shoes? They'll look at their, well, I don't know. Where were you last with them? Well, I don't know. I'll look at them and they'll be out in the backyard. And I say, you weren't even in the backyard. Oh, okay. Like, I mean, as adults, we retrace our steps. As kids, they lack reversal, and so they don't do that. And so they have some little problem-solving problems. Another one of their, their problem-solving um, issues is called conservation. Conservation, like if you take water, two different four-ounce containers, and you uh, are two of the same four-ounce containers. They're exactly the same. And you ask the child, you know, are these holding the same amount of water? They'll say Yes. But then you take that one four ounce container and you pour it into a long cylindrical tube that still holds the same four ounces and ask them which one's holding more water. And they'll say the long one, the tall one. They don't understand that water hasn't conserved its volume. It's now the same water spread out in a long tube. Um, it hasn't changed. They think that it can magically change from container to container. It's called conservation. So they have all these funny little traits that cause their problem solving, all sorts of issues. They also have one called animism. Animism is why they love their little stuffed animals. I mean, if you leave Mr. Peanuts, their little stuffed animal, out in the backyard at grandma's house, and you've left grandma's house, and they say, hey, where's Mr. Peanuts? And you say, oh, I bet we left him at grandma's. They'll start crying. Oh, no, he's, he's alone in the backyard. They ascribe human traits to inanimate objects. And so this is one reason they get into so much taking care of their dolls. And of course that's practice and all that, but play is a very serious thing for them because they give all these human traits to these dolls and things like that. That's a pre-operational period. Then we go into the concrete operations period. The concrete operations period is usually six to 12, 13 or so. And um, in concrete operations, they can actually become pretty good problem solvers. They've gotten over a lot of those issues that they have, like centrism and conservation, things like that. However, they struggle with abstract thinking. So yeah, you give them concrete problems, they can solve it. You give them a lot of abstracts, and they really struggle with it. So something like algebra, where we have to use a lot of symbolic thought, like X plus 2. X is symbolic for a number. Some of you are still confused about algebra, right? You see the X, and you're like, what's going on? Why are you putting letters with my numbers? Let me help you here. The X is symbolic of a number, you know, X plus two equals four. Two combined with this number will equal four. But for them, they have a hard time with symbolic thought, and so it causes problems. Um, they have a hard time with, with doing that, and it all has to be done kind of mentally, and so that's a, that's, a struggle. that's a struggle for them. So that's the concrete operations. They also see things as very much right or wrong or very cut and dry. So I remember watching a news story about a... Um, about a, a, a Texas homeowner who had a burglar burst into his home. Now, the burglar thought he was gone, but the homeowner was actually sitting on his couch cleaning his gun, folks. And the homeowner, um, when the burglar came in, simply put a round in his gun and shot him, killed him right there in his living room. Now, you may hate me for this, but I kind of was like, well, that's what you get for breaking into somebody's house. Um, so I kind of was like, there you go. Don't mess with Texas. And um, my... A little boy was in the room with me and he said, so it's okay to kill people? And I was like, well, well no, I, I mean, in that situation, he said, but the Bible says thou shalt not murder. 
And I was kind of like, but you got to read the fine print. You know, like if a fool busts in your house, you got to pop a cap in the fool. I think that's somewhere in the Bible. Um, and so I'm, I'm here and it was the funniest conversation because I'm trying to give my son all of these different examples of times when I thought it was okay to kill a fool. And in his mind, I mean, it says thou shalt not murder. It's very cut and dry, right? So that's that's um, that's the the concrete operations. Now, formal operations then is where we are able to do pretty advanced problem solving with all these mental, all these things in our head, and use symbolic thought. They're more likely to be be able to engage in other people's perspectives. I mean, one of the things that really held them back from two to six is they had that egocentrism going on. Egocentrism is I am the center of my own universe. I can't see anybody else's perspective but mine. Um, by the time there are formal operations, 12 or 13 or above, they can definitely do that and do it very well. And so um, formal operations are very good problem solvers. They can think about hypothetical situations. For instance, a question that Piaget would ask for this age group is, what if snow were dark purple? Well, the concrete operations thinker would not even have anything to do with that conversation. They would say, well, snow's not dark purple. The formal operations thinker says, well, I couldn't wear white ski pants. Or, you know, would it taste like grape? And if it did, could you have it like snow cones? Now, I would tell that person, be careful, because yellow snow doesn't taste like lemon. Be careful on that deal, right? Never eat yellow snow. And so, but anyway, at least the formal operations thinker can think in that way and have symbolic thought. Um, and so there were some critics of Piaget's theories that said, first of all, he didn't do enough research cross-culturally. And some of that research has shown that kids are a little more fluid between those stages than we think, especially with objects that are familiar to them. And so he did his research with objects that were familiar to um, the kids in, in the, the culture he was studying. When we try to do that same research with kids in, the, in other cultures, they don't do very well. But if you do research with materials they're used to seeing, they do pretty well. So how can a kid move from one stage to the next? A few different ways they can do that. First of all, maturation. Just like physical maturation, we get bigger, our brain changes in structure and we get more, more mature and it can shift gears in our thinking. Okay, so maturation. Experience and interactions are also have a lot to do with that. So um, the more experiences your child has, especially they'll, they'll be able to apply those in other situations too and maybe be able to move through Piaget's stages a little more quickly. So experience social interaction, for instance. Social interactions really get you over your egocentrism, right? I mean, the idea that you look at a kid and you see their car and you say, mine, and so you take the car. And then the other kid whacks you in the face. Egocentrism is this idea that I am God, basically. I'm the center of my own universe. God just got... Cold cocked, just got whacked in front in the face. You can't be very very egocentric when you're standing there and just got slapped, right? And so the kid realizes maybe I should learn to share or ask permission. So social interactions can help move us. Now, um, Piaget said we had all these things, these mental schemas or these um, mental structures where we organize our thoughts. So, for instance, the first time I see a dog, I create a folder full of dogs and so for, for with just that dog in there and then I add dogs to that these are called schemas okay so I see my little dog I get home from the hospital dog begins to lick me parents are like that's our dog that's skippy whatever I put I make it a folder in my mind and it's marked skippy I'm out walking and uh, when I'm six months old we see a great dane and I kind of point to it and parents are like look at that dog or that puppy and now I add a new um, dog into there so I've got Great Danes and Shih Tzus, and I've got my little dog Skippy, and I've got all these animals in there. Um, what if your kid, you took them to see some, um, some goats? Well, baby goats kind of look like puppies if you've ever seen one, right? So your child might look at those baby goats and say, oh, look, it's a puppy. Now, what they're trying to do is a process called assimilation. Assimilation is where we try to take new information and pair it up with information we already know. And if it fits, great. But instead, you say, no, that's not a puppy. That's a kid. Now, that freaks them out because you said kid. They had a folder for kid too, right? And these don't look anything like the kids they know. These are the weirdest looking kids they've ever seen. No, you say, oh, those are kids. That means they're, they're goat babies, right? Those are goats. They have to make a new folder marked goat. That's called accommodation. Accommodation is how we sort out and organize new information. So assimilation is where we take information we knew, 
Accommodation is where we make a new folder because this information is so new that I've got to make a new folder. Now that's just a brief overview of Piaget. I hope you'll read a lot more about him in your book.